But in all of this, Luke was arguing something else, because something we all share, and, and some of us in this room share, because not all of us are, are, are working in academic institutions, but some of us who work in the privilege of academic uh, institutions uh, have struggled all our lives with what is our role, what is our purpose, particularly those of us who come from outside of the system, whose families never went to university and tried to dissuade us from going to university, and also living with the shame of many of our university colleagues in the way they, they adopt only too willingly a top-down approach. How institutions really function, he argues, is crucial. To identify the real consequences of their functioning, in the different segments of social formation, to identify the systems of thought which underline these institutions and their practices. To me, this is expose. This is about exposing the way organizations work, the way in which they incorporate, the way in which they do not resolve, but always create and, uh, 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 and, pr and perpetuate uh, and reproduce the very issues that we are critiquing. Showing the historical context of these systems where would we be without historical materialism in a critical analysis? We could see that in Fergal's paper this morning, when he was looking at going forward uh, in terms of the Irish language and, the, and what had happened in the, process, in, 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 in the process after the release of the prisoners, but he was also looking back to put it into its real context, not the Protestant Catholic uh, tribal um, stuff that is so far removed from the reality of here, but right in the heart of the core, naming it as it is in colonization. Not talking about the famine. How patronizing that is to Ireland to talk about the famine uh, when we all know it was the great hunger or the great starvation. That did not happen by chance. That was part of colonial rule <coughs> and its consequences. Showing the historical context of these systems, the constraint they exercise on us, and the fact that they have become so familiar to us that are part of our perceptions, our attitudes, our behavior. And finally, the criminologist working with those pra involved practitioners to modify the institutions and their practices and to develop other form forms of thought. When somebody says to me, oh, you're an academic who works in the community, I kind of go, where do you think I sleep? You know? <laughs> I live in the community, you know? My house has been broken into four or five times. You know, the car's been knocked three or four times, you know? I have kids going past me going, ah, you know, when I, when I used to run, they go, I say, oh, get your knees up, you old man. You know, I live in a community. I walk, I walk into an out of pubs. I shop in shops. You know, what do they think academics do? They're fed intravenously through the ceiling, you know, in an, in an ivory tower. I mean, it's just nuts, this idea that those of us who are really committed politically somehow leave all that behind when we walk through the doors of our offices. Because in that context, and in his interview with Rebecca, he was clear about this, Luke, about the, pers the political as personal. And we know that we know this mantra from, 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 um, from, from our feminist sisters. That was a great enlightenment for me as a young academic, was reading their work, the post Simone de Beauvoir work, around the, the, the relationship between the political and the personal. And he says nearly everybody was raised to believe that those images which are, are behind criminal justice are true. So then I began to say to people, but we are criminal justice. And you can imagine him saying that, we are criminal justice. And abolition of criminal justice is that you abolish that in yourself in the same way we're doing with racism. Out damn criminal justice, to quote Shakespeare. And in the same way we're doing that with gender differences. You abolish criminal justice in yourself. And abolishing means that you will not anymore talk that language. I can actually hear these words coming out yeah. of his mouth. And if you do not talk that language anymore, then you see other things. You see other things. It not only gets rid of something, it opens your eyes to something else. It's like that abolition, he says. So in our own work, how do we take that forward? I'm not going to read this long quote, but this comes, this, this, this comes from my most recent work, and it comes out of the... Uh, also, also rooted in the book Power, Conflict and Criminalization, where I've tried to argue once and for all how we cannot in any way understand how the state pathologizes, how it argues around weak socialization, social dysfunction, when we live in a society that is anything but meritocratic, anything but fair and equal. 
that administrative criminology, the criminology that draws down the big grants, and it proposed, proposed that overarching structural relations of advanced capitalism, patriarchy, and neo-colonialism dominate, absolutely dominate the decisions that are made within administrative criminology. And also, I would add to that, age. It's inherently conflictual and subjugating all of those structural determinants of our lives. But I don't want, in terms of talking about the, e the politics and economics of reproduction, the unevenness of, of, of product and distribution, I don't want to talk, when we talk about the whole pro process of legacies of racism and xenophobia, the exclusion of children, young people from our debates, I don't want to be interpreted as some sort of crude determinist. That's why we coined the phrase all those years ago about determining contexts. They are contexts of determinism, but we have to work hard to rise above them, to challenge them, to fight them, to exclude them, and to quote root loop, to get rid of them from, out of our, from within ourselves. And in that argument, what I'm trying to put forward, and it's not just me, it's part of a whole process around analyzing power, authority, and legitimacy, is it's not limited to material, i.e. economic or physical force interventions, but supported by the deep-rooted ideologies that dominate our lives and create that notion of compliance and conformity. And I go on to say the populist appeal of authoritarianism, it's answering a question from yesterday actually, often connected to folk devils, demonization, moral panics, is a tangible manifestation of social forces. It's at the social level that, that, uh, that ideology is maintained and then goes into that, that, that Gramscian notion of the hegemonic process that smooths the road to prison. It, it leads inevitably to prison. If we accept those determining contexts, prison is the end of its road. Well, actually, death in prison is the end of its road. Ensuring that few politicians will acknowledge openly the prison as an indefensible, institutionalized, discriminatory utility that is geared to managing marginalized and alienated problem populations. And we can see that absolutely starkly in terms of our discussion last night over political prisoners. But when the question comes, well, aren't all prisoners political? The answer to that is, of course they are, but in this determining context political with a small p as opposed to political standing for a particular or specific cause. I struggled as hard as I could. When they tried to pull my sweater off, it got stuck over my head and I couldn't breathe. Instinctively, I raised my chin. Again, they slammed my face into the floor and one of the warders kept it pressed down with her knee. My arms were twisted so far back that I thought they'd break. I yelled that I was having my period. But that didn't stop them. They grabbed me by the hips, managed to get the trousers down below my waist, and then they yanked them over my ankles. I couldn't breathe for the pain. They managed to strip me naked. As I lay there on the ground, they threw me a blanket and a sanitary napkin. The warden who held me down with her knee wasn't finished. She, as she was leaving, she landed me a violent kick in the ribs. That's Karen Quinn, Republican political prisoner. Mourn House, 1993. Then they all held me out in the corridor. I only had a suicide dress on and I was told I could keep my pants because I had an ST, a sanitary towel on. But when the men were holding me, they got a woman's screw to pull my pants off. That shouldn't have happened. Then they covered me in sellotape to keep the dress closed and handcuffed me and dragged me off to the male hospital. I've hung myself a pile of times. I just ripped the dress and make a noose. But I'm only doing that because of the way they're treating me. The cell floor is colored, covered in piss because they took the piss pot out the other night. There are flies in the cell. They won't let me clean it. I haven't had a shower now in four days. I've had no mattress or blanket either in the past few nights. The same prison, but not a political prisoner with a big P, a political prisoner with a small P, who'd been imprisoned in an adult jail since she was 15, who was here in solitary <laughs> confinement on permanent lockdown with no mattress, only a canvas blanket, and no, un no underwear except when she was at the hospital. This was a letter to her sister, which I use with the permission of her sister. Why did I ask her sister for the permission and not Annie? because she took her own life the same week of this incident. 
and Linda Moore, who was here this morning, and I gave evidence and were cross-examined at her inquest. I was put in the hospital wing for nine days. They brought me over here, the punishment block, for one night. That night I tried to hang myself and they wouldn't take me back over. I hear voices and see things. The voices tell me to do them, self-harm. And I release the pain as well. It's terrible, so it is. You sleep and you keep changing positions. I suffered from a bad back because I was in a car accident and they won't even give me my own clothes in case I did anything stupid. Just look at what they make me go to the toilet in. That's for night time. It's a disgrace. They don't give me underwear or nothing. It's hard. They just give you a wee sanitary towel and that's it. It's hard. This is an interview with Kira in the same cell. An interview done by myself and Linda in the same cell that Annie took her own life. And why was Kira in that position? She was in that position because she self-harmed. There wasn't a part of her arm from her wrist to her shoulder on either arm, from her ankles to her hips, that wasn't cut or scoured or torn or ripped. She was bleeding. The way they managed her was to put her in a suicide dress, put her in a strip cell, put her with a concrete plinth for somewhere to, to lie, and no mattress, just one canvas blanket. And Kira was 16 years old. And that day when we interviewed her, that day we stayed with her and we, we, we said we would get her out of those situations because you cease being a researcher. You come out of that situation and you just, get, you just go straight to judicial review. But in that situation, we had to stay with her longer than we'd expected. We didn't get to Roseanne Irvine, who that day had been told she might lose access to her child. And we were due to interview her at, four at three o'clock that afternoon. And we didn't get there. And that night, Roseanne took her own life. And that will stay with me all of my life. Because I know, I'm convinced that if I'd have got there, we would have given her the support. We would have told her there is no way they'll take away your child. In our work, one of the things we try to argue, and it's our current book we're working on, which is pulling this research together, our research identifies the unmet needs of women prisoners against a backdrop of violence and restraint, strip searching, systematic denial of bodily integrity, self-harm, segregation, appalling physical and mental health care, and so on, minimal car, minimal contact with families, right the way down to arguing, yes, look what we're saying. Look what we, the great abolitionists, are saying. We recommend discreet accommodation, gender-specific policies, regimes and programs. We recommend them because I can't stand to see women in those situations for one minute longer. So the great abolitionists are going into the prison and coming out saying, make it better. Are we suddenly transformed into reformists? No, because we also seek the abolition of women's imprisonment.